So welcome to Wells Branch Community Church. And this week, if you couldn't tell by that little video, we're going to be talking about prayer. Excellent. So uh, in fact, we have, if you're just joining us, if you haven't been to church in a while, this is like your first time ever, this is a perfect time for you to have come. It's like as if God made it for you. So I'm so excited about that. We're right in the middle of a series called What is a Church? And let me catch you up if you haven't been with us for a while. So right here it is. We first message, uh, Ed, right here, talked to us about the church is a people brought together those, those who are near and far. So you take those people that grew up in church, like churchified, like church, 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 Awanas, look like little general patents running around with their Awanas things. And uh, then, or maybe they're in vacation Bible school, back your Bible club, blah, blah, blah. You were grew up church. All right. And then we also have those that were far from God, like thought God was weird, dumb, stupid. I don't like drug dealer, prostitutes. Uh, people like didn't want anything to do with God. And both those people have somehow made it into this church. In fact, we are so excited that we can have people that uh, have come out of total life of darkness, total life of, um, you know, destruction for them and others. And then those that kind of got themselves going with a whole bunch of religious activity still were in darkness. But out of the darkness came to the light. And Jesus somehow in the midst of that saved them and made them one people. Well, Kind of like uh, when you get married, two different people come together, become one, and it's kind of a mess. That first year of marriage can be a little bit challenging. So if this is your first year of marriage, it's a mess. That's kind of normal. So just hang in there. All right. And so what we've seen is that when you bring these two people together, first thing they need to learn how to do is love one another. In fact, that's what Jesus said. This command I give you that you would love one another. They will know that we are Christians by our love. It's kind of this great thing. And, um, and then... Um, one of the ways that you show people you love them is you serve them. And so every Sunday morning, like we've got a, just a dump truck full of kids back there. And uh, there's a ton of them. And they are being uh, loved and served by volunteers who are choosing to serve your children. So tell them thank you. Um, that's really exciting for us. Um, but serving isn't just a Sunday thing so we can kind of keep our own little, you know, pyramid scheme going. Rather, it's like this thing where we're trying to serve other people, which is why we raise... to give away to people we don't even know and um, bless them because we are praying for the city and we want to show them that we're here to serve them. Um, And that's why we we are constantly getting on on to everybody about serve your neighbors, like especially the ones that don't know Jesus. They need to know who Jesus is by the way that they're served. And so we said, okay, the church's people are near and far. There was love and then they are serving. But kind of the thing that drives all that is a knowledge of God's word. And so we don't want to be um, spiritual dum-dums. We want to be people that love God because we've been infused by his word. In fact, um, we, we said last week that, um, you know, there's really no excuse for not reading, listening, hearing, watching your Bible, right? I mean, there's about a billion different ways technology-wise where you can get uh, the Bible into your life. Uh, Adrian had a She'd never listened to the Bible. She thought, I'll never listen to it. But she was doing laundry, and she says, I don't know when I'm going to have time to read my Bible today. So she hits play on First Peter. And what do you know? She listened to First Peter and Second Peter. She's like, wow, this stuff is really great. I, didn't, I had no idea that stuff was in there. It's funny. When you listen to it, you'll start to hear. And for the first time, like stuff interacts, intersects with your soul. It's great. And so we wanted to be informed. It's God's information. It's inspiration that informs our passion, our love for God, and our service for him. And so that was kind of like, that's the church is, you know, our head, our hands, and our heart. Those are the three areas that we're, we're primarily talking about. And this week, we're going to transition kind of what sort of like the church does. All right, the church is a people who prays, to which, you know, that's what religious people are supposed to do. You know, especially if, if you're not a Christian here, you're like, oh, you're talking to your imaginary friend again. Oh, that's so sweet. You know, I, I actually had an imaginary friend. Uh, her name was Lisa. I had her until about, I was five, six years old. I'm not sure why it was a girl, but evidently that's what I had. And, um, and so I would talk, and you know, mom would have to set a place for Lisa at the table, and, you know, we'd go find Lisa's toys. And she was really great at taking blame for stuff. So um, that's kind of how it worked, right? So you had your little imaginary friend. And so what a lot of you are like, oh, that's really sweet. You've taken, like, this desire or need or this little crutch that you have to have a friend, and you kind of purport it to this thing that's universal that loves you and kind of has this connection with you. Well, sort of, but not really. See, because this is a real God that we're really talking to, and he has a real connection with every one of us. So if you're not a believer today, you're going to kind of hear, well, that's really strange, and that's okay, because I'm so glad you're here. But for those of you who, um, you know, you, you grew up in church, maybe you heard some people, like, abuse prayer, like the prayer abusers, and you just were like, 
you maybe went to a prayer meeting once and after like some guy droned on for about a couple hours and you woke up later, you're like, that'll never happen again for me. Thank you very much. Or like, uh, you know, you, you kind of got tired with people just always, you know, pulling you aside, wanting to pray and you're just like, whatever. And I wanted us to kind of walk through some of the do's and don'ts of prayer because I think for a lot of us, we get kind of taught, you know, kind of like, what am I supposed to do? But I wanted to just convince you, I'm going to take a, a second here and especially for our non-Christian friends, prayer works. Like, it really, really, really works. Um, I'm trying to think of the most outlandish things that have happened um, that I've gotten to watch firsthand God do some crazy stuff. Um, uh, Michael, he's from Watermark, sitting right there in Dallas. And he and I were involved in a little uh, Bible study. And we had this gay activist that would show up. It was like the greatest thing ever. Like, the guy that would, said he hated church, wanted nothing to do with church. But he kept coming to the church to tell us how wrong it was. And so we invited him to uh, a Bible study. And I would be praying and praying and praying and praying. And and we'd go hang out in the neighborhood. It was like great times for us. And uh, it was wonderful times. And so I'd be praying for my friend Don and praying and praying and praying. And uh, eventually he comes to faith in Christ. I mean, I'll never forget just crying my eyes out. I was in the Dallas Seminary Library of all places listening to his voicemail saying, I don't know what happened to me, but... I'm a Christian. It was the weirdest thing ever. It was so cool. Um, and I was just so excited about that. Um, but that, that, that was, that was happened several years ago. But even here at this church, um, just looking at this audience, there's Alvaro sitting right there who was a skeptic and said, I don't know if I'm really into your God. And he came to explore God series and we would pray for Alvaro and he would come and meet with us and he'd come to men's meetings and it was weird. All the stuff he came to, it was really kind of shocking. And we'd pray, 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 pray for him. And then God somewhere and somehow in the midst of that opened up his heart. It was so exciting. Yeah, we can get, celebrate that. And I can go over, over. Yeah, I mean, like something to get excited about. Tom Dom sitting right here. Mike Bauer sitting right there. Those guys are a result of prayer. I'm just like, these are real people that are right here that I've been praying for. And they came and gave their lives to Jesus. And not only that, they're like serving and wanting to be a missionary in Austin to reach more people with a life change around Jesus. Which... When I say that, again, as a non-believer, you're like, you get skeptical. You're like, that just added more people to your pyramid scheme. This is just, I know this is all about money somehow, right? And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to convince you otherwise. But no, I really believe there's a real God who really, really loves me. And I so desperately am in love with him. I want you to know him. And we've seen other stuff as people being healed from stuff, uh, from disease. And not just physical. We're talking like marriage, like marriage that diseased. I want divorce type stuff. People come and say, it's over. And I'm like, let's pray. And they're still together. You see, um, prayer is not just a, it's the, the, you know, the Hail Mary, you know, trying to win at the end of the game kind of moment. Cause you'll, everybody prays at that time, but it's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. And I want to walk with you through this because I, for some of you, you're like, I believe, I believe that prayer works for other people. But you don't know my story, Chris, and it doesn't work for us. If you were to know my circumstances, if you were to know the things that have gone on in my life, you would see clearly that prayer is, just, <laughs> that's your imaginary friend. I'm glad that you have your little crutch. That, that's sweet. But that's not my story. And so um, I want you to, you know, again, if you're not a Christian, you're going to walk along through us as I'm going to try and teach some of our Christians to kind of get invited into this world of constant communion with God who really has a message. Because remember, just like in that the video we watched, it's all about text. And this is all about text. See, when you start to interact with the text, it changes you. And the text matters because you know who the sender is. And you can trust him. And so this morning, we're going to be talking about prayer. All right, a couple of do's and don'ts on prayers. All right, here's Jesus. And he kind of comes off with some really tough teaching on prayer. He says stuff like, pray for your enemies and those who persecute you, which you're like, I don't think you know who I work for, right? I mean, like that, like in the way he treats me and that is like, you know, if we were going to go civil war, I'm just hoping he's on the other side so I get to kill him. I, I mean, I know that there's some of you who have thought those things. Uh, or how about this? And maybe it's, it's kind of weird. Like your enemy might be the one you're married to at any given moment. I think that's, I mean, we need to be praying for the people that we have conflict with. All right, so pray for your enemies and those who persecute. Here's another do. Do pray for more workers to reach more people, the life changing around of Jesus. All right, so this is one of those things that I'm kind of a little bit insane about. Every day at 10.02 a.m., um, no matter what I'm doing or who I'm with, I'll break out and like, Lord, 
I'm praying for more workers to send your word. Um, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send workers. So I pray every day at 1002 that he might send some workers. And we've got 30 or 40 people here moved from Dallas or Denton or Texas A&M or um, Bryan College Station. And they have come here, I think, pretty clearly as a result of those prayers. I'm, I'm completely convinced of that. And it's so exciting to watch God bring more and more people uh, down from Dallas. I'm not sure what happened with that. So um, there is an agenda on that, by the way. All right. So do pray according to God's will. God's will. All right. So God's only going to do his will, so you need to pray according to it. In fact, this is where it gets kind of weird. It's like, well, if God's going to do it anyway, why do I need to pray? Right? Like, this is what I always hear from people. Well, if God's going to do it anyway, it's all going to happen, then why should I be praying for it? Well, I'll tell you why. You see, one of the neatest things that God allows us to do is to be active in his will, to be a player in his will. It's like he is inviting you to have a part in and a real responsibility with his will, his, his life. His, his, he is, he's not like just a God that stands up here and has all his robots doing things. No, he wants to actively part, you to participate in that. So here's how this works. I'll give you an example from the Bible, first off. So um, do you guys remember Abraham? Not Abraham Lincoln, like way before that. Um, so he's a guy that was the Old Testament. And he comes up upon a guy named Abimelech. And Abraham has this weird thing with his wife where he keeps giving her away. This is not something to follow. Men, don't, like, don't give your wife away. Anyway, he does that like on the second time and because uh, he's afraid of the guy. And God comes to um, Abimelech in a dream says, I'm going to kill you and your entire family if you don't give Sarah back to Abraham. And then he's like, okay, why didn't anyone tell you? He's like, and you know, Abraham's going to pray for you once you do that and you won't die. It was weird. It was, and then uh, a couple verses later, Abraham prays for Abimelech and he doesn't die. And so Abraham, it was just the weirdest story, but Abraham in the midst of that prays and God uses that. I, I sometimes I was baffled by it. It's like, you didn't need to have Abraham pray for him, but you did. And you're going to see this happen. Job, you guys remember Job? Like some of you guys think you're Job because like so many bad things have happened to you, but you're not. So, and, or like some of you live in constant fear. You might be Job. That's another weird one. Uh, anyway, Job was a guy who had like everything bad you could ever imagine happened to him. And all at the end of the, like, the story of Job, uh, he's got some buddies who are like, you know what, Job? This is, what you, this is why everything bad's happening. And they give him some really terrible advice. You ever have any friends give you just the worst advice ever? All right, well, God, to punish them, is going to kill them. He says, you guys give some really bad advice, and I'm going to kill you. But your friend Job is going to pray for you, and I won't kill you. And so then Job goes over, and he prays for them, and they don't die. It it happens there. So what happens, what I want you to see is this. is that God is wanting to use your prayer to save someone's soul. All right? God is wanting you to use your prayer to heal somebody. Sickness, disease, marriage disease. Child disease, teenager disease. They eventually grow up, I'm told. And then here's some of the don'ts. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. Here's from a lot of us. We're like, I went to this church Sunday and um, we learned that we should pray. So I prayed Monday and Tuesday. Nothing happened. So I gave up on Wednesday, right? I mean, I think that's what happens for us is that we're like, we really believe it's true. And then it's true. And then we just kind of quit. We're like, I don't really know if I'm, I'm, this is for me. Like maybe God answered somebody else's prayer. But I mean, listen, when I'm praying for my gay activist friend, that took months. When I'm praying for uh, Tom Dom right here, that took months. So other people took years. But when eternity is at stake, man, I'm praying like crazy because God is the only one who can do anything. He's the only one. Listen, you know this when it comes, when you've gotten sick or you've had somebody really close to you get sick, you have no other options. After the, doc, after the last doctor has given his last little, I don't know what to do, you're like, God, please. Don't lose heart. And then don't pray boastful and inflated prayers to put others down. This is a classic story. Uh, Jesus tells, there's like two dudes. He says, don't be like this guy, but be like this guy. And he says, there's this one guy who's really religious. And he's like, thank you, God, that I'm not like that guy. <laughs> you know, the, the guy that lives in constant comparison. Um, that, that's you if that's kind of like, I'm just glad I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm just glad I, I wasn't wearing that. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to be caught dead in that. You know, I, I don't know what the prayers look like, but... <laughs> I've just heard that some people pray. And like some people are just like so enamored with themselves and they feel like 
they kind of put everybody else down. They got to point out everybody else's sin. And then what happens usually when you pray like that, you talk like that, which is what has given Christians bad name everywhere, right? So like you're, I, you, some of you hate Christians because of what you've heard on the news and what you've seen on TV and how we're portrayed. And there's some crazy person telling everybody they're going to hell and it really hasn't done much for you. And you're like, there you go. That's, that's not what we're going for, right? Don't pray boastful inflated prayers. In fact, in that one section that, of where Jesus teaches on that, he's like, here's the guy that went, went, to, went home justified before God that day. It was a guy, a guy that couldn't look up at heaven. He just kind of, it's like pleading with God. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's us. And then he's going to give two more don'ts. Don't pray to be seen by people. And don't pray meaningless words to impress God or others. And we're going to get into this more, but there's something in us um, that wants to go and impress other people. I was at a uh, pastor's like prayer retreat thing. Like you get a bunch of pastors together and, uh, you know, not that I would ever do this, but some pastors measure their identity by how big their church is. Like, you know, like my church is 7,000, my church is 1,000, you know, but you don't really want to come out and say that because that would be clearly awkward and weird. But the way you kind of measure your identity with a bunch of other pastors is you pray really long prayers. And it's just like the war of the prayers. Like some people are passing out, like, yeah, got him. Got, you know, like, it's, you know, they're just falling away. And it's like, I'm going to withstand the prayer you know, into the past midnight. And we're praying just like, anyway, it, that can get really bad. All right. Don't go to pastor's prayer meetings unless you're a pastor and you know what you're in for. Anyway, so like that's, that's what happens, right? And, and, and I'm not saying that they're all bad or anything like that, but sometimes people just want to like impress other people with how awesome they can pray. And maybe that's how you felt. And whatever church experience you had, you were like, <laughs> here we go again. So-and-so is going to unleash the prayer volume seven. And it never stops. All right, and that does nothing. In fact, what that we're going to show is that's more like um, a pagan or a non-Christian than somebody who knows God. Uh, in fact, here's, here's Jesus. He's, he's going to break this down. And uh, he says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, which you're like, wow, that's really weird. I thought a lot of Christians were hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So... When you get to be seen by other people and that's your heart, you get, that's your reward. Now, that doesn't mean never pray in public. We pray in public here all the time. Like, I pray for you, pray that people get saved. Jesus prayed in public. He, you know, he blessed his food in public. Uh, he did all sorts of public prayer. That doesn't mean don't do public prayer. It just means the intent of your prayer needs to be God, not other people. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then in this, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentile do. Gentiles do. If you have like the King James Version, it says like vain repetitions as the pagans do. Like just do it saying the same thing over and over and over. And it has no meaning. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. All right, now before we, we go into this even deeper, we're about to, to teach on the Lord's Prayer, which... Have you grew up Catholic or Lutheran or some, some of that sort? And you memorized about a billion Our Fathers. Anybody? All right, so me too. So like, um, it was like, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our earth is heaven. Give us a day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Leave us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. No, amen. And now I, that was me. I was like on it. Like when we were like Our Fathers, I was a race. And I was first every time. Now it took several years to develop the skill. But, you know, eventually I, I would just, I was like, who's, who's ready? You know, I was like, it's kind of like pulling out my uh, pistol to nail somebody on that. I digress. All right, we're about to pass out Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, uh, raise your hand in the air. One will come to you. If you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. That's page 811. And we're about to go into the Lord's Prayer. And the reason why I brought that up is because a lot of you have said the Lord's Prayer, but you have no idea what it means. It's kind of like when you learn a song when you're a little kid, and then like you kind of mesh words together, and um, you make up a new song, and it has no real meaning to you. All right, so I don't want... This prayer to have no meaning to you. All right, so Matthew chapter 6, page 811, and in the Bible we're passing out. Matthew 6, verse 9, page 811. And we're going to start off, I'm just going to read it for you, and I'm not going to go into like super speed mode, although there is a temptation every time, so I've got to focus. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, we're going to break this down. First part of this. Our Father in heaven. Now, when, when we read the word Father in our culture, um, that usually doesn't bring up like happy, fun moments with Dad. Can we just be real? Like, um, when I say Father, a different image for each one of us comes up. <sighs> Like some of you, and this, this is where I, I don't want to downplay this because, you know, we can be funny for a little bit, but then it gets kind of serious. Because some of you have had some dads that were not so um, fatherly. And it's distorted your image of God. In fact, you might even say there cannot be a God because of the way my father is. And I think that almost proves the point of how powerful this word is. Because some of you, um, your, your dad might have been abusive, Sexually, physically, verbally. And you can't see him as father. Some of you have a, have, had a father who was maybe a, a, a biological dad. That he was um, distant due to death or divorce. Or you don't even know who he is. Never around. And so when you read the word father, absentee comes up. Deadbeat comes up to your instant vocabulary. Let down comes into your vocabulary. And some of you had coach dad, where you got the love, but man, it came at a price. And you had to earn it. And it was a constant kind of beating on your soul. And so when you think father, you think a list of rules. And you don't think relationship. And so Jesus, more than anything, he wants us to, to destroy that kind of picture of your dad and replace it with father in heaven. Because it puts a whole different strata on it. When, when we're not talking about um, father that hurts you, we're talking about perfect dad. Like better than dad that wears sandals with black socks. That dad that comes home with a briefcase and, you know, and is very loving to everybody. All right, Like better than that. And like we want a dad. And what's weird about kids, they don't even care how cool their dad is. They just want their dad to be there and love them. right? And so not only is... This father in heaven, cool, he is like the creator of cool, and he is like ultimately in your life for a positive reason. And this is what's weird. So like, you don't even have to be a Christian. Or you can be a non-Christian, have a wrong view of God, but you could be a Christian and have the wrong view of your father. But you see, the church is the people who pray, and we reflect on the relationship we have with God. So let me kind of explain it for you. Is that There was a relationship between man and God that was perfect way back in the day. And then something happened. Rebellion. We rebelled against God. And then our kids inherited that rebellion. It's kind of like AIDS. It's not like you, you pick to be born with it. Like, please, let me have AIDS. Be an AIDS baby in Africa. No one's saying that. But all of a sudden, you inherit the sin nature. And then there's this complete separation between you and God. But God so loved the world, the whole thing is based on love, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And so that's happened. Over the course of time, people have turned their lives to God in faith. And they be, he's become their father. And that, so that's why we reflect. And, and tomorrow night, at first Monday prayer, 7 o'clock, Live for More Center, we're going to be praying. We're going to be reflecting on this relationship. We're going to be thanking God for adopting us. In fact, there's this thing called the doctrine of adoption. And that's what I want you to fully embrace, is that you are a child of a living God. Now, what happens is, is people don't have that view. Whenever we, we've gone, we've making God the, the grumpy landlord and, you know, like we just want to keep stuff from him. Like, you know, I don't want, you know, I can't pray that because God might find out or, or like we've got this list of things in our head that to be accepted, to keep up paying rent because we have contractuality with God. We kind of made a bunch of deals with God and we're like, I'm going to do this and you're going to do this. And that's how it is. When you, when you sign up with a landlord, um, you become a renter and you, it's contractual. As long as you pay the rent, and that you get to stay there. And for some of you, as long as I keep praying, as long as I keep doing good things, as long as I keep, keep my, my deal, then, then I'll be accepted. And that's what pagans do. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. And so they, they throw up useless repetition and, and meaningless phrases because they think they're going to be heard. And here's what's sad. A lot of Christians are praying like pagans. And I want us to pray like people who know a dad. 
That's my son. See, see, Austin, he was made in my image, right? I mean, so I like to dress him like me. And, uh, I mean, he is the greatest thing ever. So for those of you who are about to be a parent or you are a parent, it's like the, I mean, it's so cool. This is my, my, my son, right? He's made in my image. Like, there is never a time, 3 a.m., I'm not going to get up to, you know, when he's bawling his eyes out, be like, yeah, sleep it off. Like, no, we're going to get up. We're going to go help him out. That's a need. That's, that's, what, that's what, he has access to me at all hours of the day. It, it, that's just the coolest thing. I mean, here's what's so great about this is that at any, when he becomes five, there's going to be some time, I'm probably going to be wanting to work on a sermon and it's really important. He'll be like, daddy, can we play time I shoot? And I'll be like, you bet, right? I mean, because that's, there's nothing more fun to me than spending time with my son. He's my son. Now, think, think, the more I become a dad, the more I mean, I'm just like blown away by how much God loves me. Because if I know how much I love my son, then how much more does God love me? How much more does God love you? How much more does God want to infuse his love and all that into him? Like, you know, God wants to dress you up so you look just like him. He wants to hold you. He wants you to need him. That's, that's what God does. He loves dress up day. He's, he's so excited about that. That's why he always says, cl- be clothed with Christ. Boom. <laughs> See, we need to reflect on this relationship we have with God as our father, as our dad. And listen, men, we can redeem this word father. We can be the generation that doesn't screw it up. We can just put an end to the, the kind of the, the sin that's been passed down, passed down, inherited like AIDS. And it's been a blight on our society. And we can transform this country by being dads who look like more like our heavenly father than like our earthly one. And that's my heart for this church. We'd raise up some men who, will, who are looking to be fathers. Hallowed be your name. Now, there's a weird phrase. I, I, I think hallowed is kind of fallen from cool, like, part of lingo. Like, you, ver, this is not in your regular vernacular. That is really hallowed. Unless it's Halloween. Then we use hallowed, right? It's like Halloween stole our word, all right? So here's what it is. Hallowed uh, doesn't mean evil spirits and stuff. It means special, set apart, um, holy would be a great word for that. And... We want to make sure that God's name is holy. We want to revere it, right? So we want to revere God's name. And this is part of the prayer. If you notice in this, in this Lord's Prayer, the first three parts are um, worship towards God. The latter three are like the, the horizontal, like dealing with people and, and our own needs. We want to revere God's name. Now, why is it important that we revere God's name? Why is it important that we look at his name as special? <sighs> Again, I'm, I'm learning so much from my son. Because we wear his name. You see, the great thing about Austin, he didn't choose to be a pluck and pull. He is a pluck and pull. And for the rest of his life, he's going to have to deal with wearing pluck and pull on the back of his jersey. He's going to have to explain how to spell it. He's going to have to re- correct people a hundred times on how to pronounce it. Because that's his name. It's an important name. And he will know his name. He won't be able to spell strawberry, but he'll be able to spell pluck and pull. I mean, like, that's going to be something really powerful. We want him to know his name. Because it's my name. And it's my name I've given to him. And I want you to know the Lord's names. Did you know the Lord has a bunch of names he calls himself all throughout Scripture? And it's it's these names that that go on our back. Okay, because a lot of you guys will wear some other dude's uniform. Like a Dallas Cowboy game comes up and you're wearing number eight and you're Tony Romo that day. Why? Because you want to honor Romo. You're like, I love Romo. And when everybody else is writing all sorts of terrible stuff about Tony Romo, you are down with Tony Romo. I don't understand it, but, you know, that's cool. That's your thing. Right? Like that, that's a part of it. Like you honor Tony Romo every time you put his stupid jersey on. Now listen. Now listen. Every day that you're a believer in Christ, you walk out and you got his jersey on. And these are, I just want to read off a couple of the names that, that you're wearing everywhere you go. Because if you don't know them, you can't represent. Check it out. Here it is. Advocate, which means lawyer. Lamb of God. The resurrection. The life. Healer. Provider. My banner. Shepherd and bishop of souls. Judge. Lord of lords. King of kings. Man of sorrows. Head of the church. Master. Faithful and true witness. Rock. Strong tower. The righteous run to and they are safe. 
the high priest, the door, living water, bread of life, rose of Sharon, Alpha and Omega, true vine, Messiah, teacher, holy one, mediator, beloved, branch, carpenter, good shepherd, light of the world, image of the invisible God, the word, chief cornerstone, savior, servant, author, and finisher of our faith, the almighty, everlasting father, shalom, line of the tribe of Judah, I am, prince of peace, bridegroom, only begotten son, wonderful counselor, Emmanuel, God with us, son of man, day spring, the amen, king of the Jews, prophet, redeemer, anchor, commander of the army of the Lord, bright morning star, the way, the truth, and the life. You wear that. You wear that everywhere. You go clothe yourself with that because those are the names that you carry because you are a child of God. And we need to remind ourselves when we pray that every day. It's like, I need to remember who you are because, oh yeah, I reflect that. That gets you in the right mindset. All right, we're two phrases in. Here we go. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The church is a people who pray and we relinquish our personal will for God's will. We relinquish our personal will for God's will. Now, for a lot of us, um, I mean, we're single and we're like, God, just bring me the one, right? <laughs> and you prayed it over and over and over again. Been there. I was the guy. I remember, I didn't get married until I was 34. That was a lot of years of praying for that. And finally she came. And it was because we had to wait because she was 10 years younger. But it's another story. <laughs> <laughs> that was for free. All right. But so here we go. So we're praying that God's will be done. Now, one of the most important things about God's will, like he, we're praying for his kingdom to come. And his will to be done here on earth as in heaven. Now, it's going to happen one day. Jesus is coming back. All right, there's going to be no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. He's coming back. But in the meantime, in the meantime, there's a lot. In fact, a lot of you guys are trying to push that day off because there's a lot of stuff you got to do, right? We got, hey, I need to get married. I need to have kids. I need to have two kids. Uh, I was kind of planning on retirement. And then I was planning on a bigger house. I was planning on like this kind of car. And so you got to wait, right? And what we need to do is relinquish the stuff that we hold so tight because, listen, listen, listen. This is why we pray so much for eternity things. Like, we pray so much for people's souls because it's going to last more than this life, which some of you have got 80 years, a lot of you less. And we're holding on so tight to these things, and we've got to learn to let it go. And so, listen, here, here's one of the things. I'll just be honest with you. Here's the thing I'm praying about. Um, this, where we meet in this building, it's called the Rec Center, and it's going to be remodeled come August. And we're going to be homeless as a church unless God provides something. But I, so I've got to, I've, this is what I have to do. I've like, your kingdom come, God, your will be done in finding us another place to meet or paying for another place to meet on earth as in heaven. I've, I've got to trust him with that, right? I mean, we've all got to trust him with that. In fact, it gets beyond that, right? Like for some of you, it, there's like neighbors. So I have neighbors. I've got a Muslim family that lives across the street and I've been praying for them for a long time. And now they, they come over to my house like every day. Um, Ali came over yesterday and he's like, uh, Hey, he just, he, now he doesn't even knock. He just walks in and I'm like, what's going on, Ollie? We're about to go to lunch. He's like, can I come? And I'm like, sure, come on. So he, he goes and we come, we take him to uh, firehouse subs and he and I kind of enjoy the multi-flavored drinks and there's, he's entertaining Austin and Adrian are all just one big happy family. And then we go get ice cream and he gets more ice cream. I think more ice cream than from frozen desserts that it's like overflowing with the yogurt. And anyway, he's nine. Uh, and so, um, it's, it's an adventure. And we've been praying and praying and praying that uh, God would do something and move in the lives of our Muslim neighbors because we love them. Uh, we're hoping and praying that they might be uh, part of the near and far that come to one because we're praying for God's will to be done and we're, we're getting to actively, actively participate in God's will being done in their lives. Especially as that family goes th through a divorce and just all the mess and this kid comes up to me and, and I get to be a a father in a way to him be like as he says like these guys are picking on me what do i do and i take him aside i said listen i'm proud of you the kid starts welling up with tears right there that's how bad we all need it your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven this should be the echo of our hearts lord we want your will to be done here because we know there's a lot of broken people they're just struggling 
at this church right now with different stuff and your will must be done and we want to actively participate in that. Next one is give us this day our daily bread. And notice he doesn't say, give us this day our monthly bread. Like I would, I would kind of, I wouldn't mind monthly, you know, that way we get installments, you know, we could, might be able to save a little bit, you know, take a little bit out and then um, I'd have enough to accrue. If he didn't come through one day, then I could, I'd have enough saved up and then I'd have like my savings plan of bread like that, that, that works better for me. But God is calling us to be daily devoted and dependent upon him. And that's why we come to him with our personal and corporate need. We come to him with like, God, please, please bring us a money for a church. Listen, and this is where, listen, I, th- I'm going to tell a story. And you, some of you aren't going to believe me, but it's true. And the, the guy's in here. I'm not going to call his name out. But a guy came to me and he's like, hey, I, I, owe, um, the IRA, I owe the government a lot of money. And I'm like, how much? It can't be that much. I'm like, 1000 56000 And I'm like, oh, that stinks. Can you pray for me? I'm like, yeah. He's like, no, no. Can you pray for me at the IRS office? We're going to go today. All right, let's go. So we get in the, we go and, um, I, you know, I'm, I don't know anything about IRS things. So I sit down I'm like, and we, before we go in, we pray. I'm like, God, can you please just make this thing go away and do the miraculous thing that you do? You know, erase this, you know, 50 grand plus deal. Um, so we go in. And so here was my part. And I'm just listening to the conversation between the guy and the, the government lady. And I'm just like, hmm. And so he goes, well, so you're going to have to pay this. And he's like, and, and that's where I, th- I chimed in. I'm like, so how much does, can we do, like, we're going to have a financial aid plan or something? You know, that was like my contribution to the entire thing. <laughs> and she's like, yeah. Uh, I said, what's the lowest? $10 a month. 50, I mean, doing the math in your head, he'll pay that off in like 70 years. <laughs> I was in like, how is that even possible? Either God is a miraculous God or our government's in serious trouble on these debt things. All right, never mind. I won't go there. Don't answer that. Don't answer that. All right. So like, I, I just kind of looked at that and I was like, wow, God showed up and he showed off in this guy's life. And I'm like, I can't believe that happened. We're walking out. And we're like, do you believe that happened? Let's just keep going. We'll talk about it in the car. Let's get out of here. Like, we, you know, we're going to kind of seal the deal. <laughs> Listen, I, I, and when I've, I've, I've talked to numerous people here, like when when a man loses a job, there's nothing more humiliating than that because he's providing for his family or he's supposed to be providing for his family. He's kind of like, and, you know, the, everyone's looking at him going. And he's like, I know, you know. And so we've watched, we've prayed and time after time. God has been faithful to bring jobs. And again, I, I hear it. That would have happened anyway. Maybe. But you got to actively participate in God's plan. And that's power. That's exciting. Which is why God allows you to sense need. In fact, he will give you more than you can handle, right? Like some of you said, like, God will never give you more than handle. Yes, he will. And then you are going to be on the floor in the fetal. God, help me. And then he'll come through. I mean, he does it time and time and time again. Listen, I, I, I have never met a Christian that wasn't provided for. I just haven't. Okay, you're going to say, Chris, what about Africa? I've been to Africa. I've been to those places. What about, I've been to Asia. I haven't found one. I, have, I've, I haven't found a Christian community where God is not taking care of his kids. Haven't found it. Like God is going to make sure that he takes care of his children. He's a dad. He's a father. Again, not the father you've been used to. He's a perfect father who loves, loves, loves his kids and puts his name on them. And if you think for a second, I'm going to let... Austin go out without enough food or clothing, you're crazy. But even greater than me, if I have like some sort of crazy moral failure, become a serial murderer or something, and Austin's off in the street, God will take care of him. He will. If he becomes a believer. It's going to be great. We, that's why we pray for that. Save Austin. All right. And forgive us our debts. And it kind of goes right in hand with, as we also forgive, have forgiven our debtors. So we want to be a people that re- recognize sin and repent, right? So there's this part of us that daily we need to come before God and recognize our own sin because you have hurt people that you didn't even realize you hurt. Like you daily take that moral inventory of who you screwed over yesterday because I'm sure there was somebody. 
It was a word. It was like you didn't say, you know, and as a pastor, you get this extra because, like, you don't say hi to somebody right away or you, you ignore them or, like, you didn't, you know. Like, there's a lot of people that come here on a Sunday. So I'm sorry. I right, apologize. I know I've offended several of you. So, like, there's that part of it. Like, you, you, you can't, right? But forgive us our debts. Come to God contrite saying, like, I know I'm broken. And for some of you, again, you're kind of like Job, and you're like, nobody can forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm in this, the pit of despair. And you, you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, but you're still in that pit of despair. And I, I want to remind you, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Like, uh, we, we live, eat, breathe that. And here's, here's, how, here's how you know, here's part of the evidence that you know you're going to be saved, or that you are saved, is you've forgiven other people. Uh, we got to release the debt we hold on other people. Now, listen, I was a guy that had, um, I loved my dad. Man, I always thought it was so cool. My dad and I would wear the same outfits. All right, I was that kid. And then something happened about 13 years old. My dad just kind of checked out. And he, he all of a sudden had to work a whole lot. And he was no longer at all the baseball, football, or soccer, basketball games. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't there. And he kind of disappeared. Oh, he'd come back. I know, I know he'd love me in his own way. And then when he divorced my mom, and boy, that was a struggle. And then a couple months later, I've told you guys this, uh, he introduced me to his new wife. And then <laughs> and they got married previous to that. And it had only been a couple months since he'd been divorced. It was really weird. And there was a process. And when I came to faith in Christ, and when it, the fullness of the gospel hit me when I was 22 years old, I was able to look at my dad, not as a person that was just like not going to earn father of the year. But I got to see him in the full spectrum of all the brokenness he experienced. Like his dad died when he was two. His grandfather died when he was 13. He had no man in his life ever. And he was just trying to figure it out. And he didn't have anyone to lead him spiritually. And so he made some really dumb decisions. But it was through that forgiveness of just kind of understanding my dad and his plight and his struggle, that we had a great relationship over the past five, six years, seven years. So much so that when he died this past September, you know, like when sometimes people die and it's like too soon and it's like, oh, we didn't talk about everything. No, we, we were great. It was the best it ever been. In fact, it was healing in a way. Because we, we lived out the relationship of complete forgiveness, of complete, like, I don't hold anything against you. There was no, like, days of sitting there looking at my dad going, like, wow, man, why didn't you show up? And listen, I'm not downplaying the time that your dad didn't show up at your graduation, that game, um, that event, life. What I'm saying is a better father. And for me, understanding my relationship with God as a perfect dad, who love, love, loves me and gave me his name. Oh, man. I love that. And so I get to walk in that. Remember, see, forgiveness is it's two sides of the same coin. Like you forgiving other people is just really dependent on, on the amount of forgiveness you've received. And if you have an inability to forgive other people, listen, I know, listen, I, I get it. People have hurt you. I get it. And there's some unforgiveness there, but... You've got to fully focus on the amount of unforgiveness that you're holding and realize the depths of your own sin. That's just why you've got to say, God, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you, my thoughts, words, actions. You are a holy God. Your name is this, and I have not lived up to your name. I am not those things. There is something broken in me. And he says, there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And you're like, amen, thank you. And then next, now pass that on to somebody else. Because the world needs that. You need that. And then Jesus is going to take it to the next one and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. (sighs) See, the church of the people pray this, God, rescue us from evil and temptation. There's always two errors that we make when it comes to evil. Um, One error is to think that it doesn't exist, right? Like, um... And we, we come with a lot of psychological answers to the reason why of Holocaust, you know, you know, Hitler's mom, you know, and him just wasn't right. You know, whatever issue you can make up, it was kind of awkward and you just kind of move on. And 
but from you know from Stalin to Hitler to Pol Pot, all the just the terrible things of the world. Um, essentially, at some point or another, you got to say that was just evil. That wasn't just a it wasn't just a psychological disorder. It's like that was evil. And then on the flip side of that, um, there are those who blame everything on Satan and his minions. Right? We're like. The devil's behind every rock, and the devil's behind every corner. It's like, oh, don't what you know? Don't let the devil speak that. You know, I mean, like, just just too much. And the reality is, first of all, let me bring some truth to that. There's two angels for every demon. So that, isn't that good news? Like, we, we don't have to worry about that. There's two angels for every demon. And the other thing is, for those of us who know Jesus, just His name causes demons to flee. Oh man, that's exciting. Yeah, you can clap for that. All right. <laughs> Didn't realize that was such an exciting thing, but that is something exciting. When you call out His name, demons flee. But here's, here's how Satan works. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to put it to you this way. Um, this is a piano. This is what our young plays, and I won't try and play it. But um, pianos have 88 keys, right? And I want you to imagine for a moment, instead of like a keyboard, that there's a piano, a grand piano, it's got all the strings on it. You see, if I were to go, and it would be really horrific, and I'm not sure which string it would be, but if I were to go and kind of sing, and I was hold, able to hold one note, one string would vibrate on that piano, one string. It would resonate with my voice. The frequency would be the same. And that one string, that the, the tightness and the tautness that's pulled out, would resonate with me. And that's how Satan works. You see, he, he knows your voice. And he'll start to put things in your head that sound just like you. And the self-talk of self-hatred, that's Satan just messing with you. Like, of like the, when you look in the mirror and like the, the loathing and the anger and the hurt and the heartache and the, like all that stuff. That's, that's Satan just playing your, your note over and over and over and over again. Or he'll help you justify sin. <laughs> just play that note again. You deserve her. I mean, your wife, I mean, she's not really treating you right. She's not treating you what you deserve. You deserve way better. Playing the note, playing the note. Or maybe it's, maybe it's not some other girl. Maybe it's the pornography. Or maybe it's the argument. Or maybe it's the, you name it, Satan's got your note and he's just, he's hammering it on it. Because he knows your voice. And he's playing that. And he's just making you think it's all you. And see, that's, that's how Satan works. And so that's why every day we say, Lord, lead us not in temptation. Now, God will never lead you into temptation. It's impossible for God to leave you, lead you in temptation. In fact, every prayer here, every part of this is 100% guaranteed to happen. Our father is in heaven. That's where he lives. That's where he is. He's a perfect dad. Going to happen. His name is holy. Regardless of your life, his name will always be holy. It's a matter of, are you reflect, reflecting it or not? Your kingdom come, you will be done on earth as in heaven. He, Jesus is coming back. I've read the end of the book. We win. All right? Give us this day our daily bread. I've never seen a starving Christian. Just haven't seen one. He's going to meet your needs. Every time. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Going to happen. You ask for forgiveness, he's going to give it to you. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Boom. And then lead us not temptation. God does not tempt anyone, nor can he be tempted. That's God's word. But deliver us from evil. This world's broken and we're waiting for our rescue. And he promised he would. Which is why we pray ever so more fervently, God save us sometimes from ourselves, from the evil one, so that we might reflect your glory. So that Satan doesn't get a win. Because we've already won the war and he just wants to take the battle here or there. And that's our prayer. See, the, the, the church is a people who pray. I mean, that, that's what we do. That's what Christians do. We pray. In spite of it being silly, in spite of it, people accusing us of us having our psychological crutch, whatever. I'm just... This is, this is the thing that's tough about being a Christian in, in a pastor role. You get, you're like front row to like God answering prayer all the time. And so when people throw out like the God doesn't exist thing, you're just like, all right, even if I went there with you, how do you explain a bajillion things where we prayed and God did something? How do you explain that? You see, this is for those of you who are not Christian today. And we haven't done this well as a church. We have, we've been more about letting a lot of people know how bad they were instead of letting God how no cruddy we are. We've been enforcing, trying to enforce our way of life on other people. And it's impossible to do without the Holy Spirit. So like, if you don't know Jesus, there's no possible way for you to act like a Christian. So why are we expecting you to? 
but we pray. And tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, we're going to come together and we're going to pray. And we're going to lift up people's needs. And we're going to pray for this community. And um, if you fill out the bulletin thing, if you guys have one, hold it up. I want you to fill that out. Fill it out. Fill, hold up your bulletin. Someone hold it up so I can feel like I'm not alone here. All right, thank you. So on the top part, there's a part that you can tear off. And um, I want you to start thinking about what you're going to write there. In fact, um, the ushers in the back, if you like, didn't get one, um, I want you to raise your hand in the air and one will come to you. Um, because this is really important because I want us to be a people who pray. Like this is like more serious than anything else. Uh, I want you to just say like, even if it's this, God, reveal yourself to me. Like I would love that to be a bunch of prayers of people. Like, I don't know if I believe in this God thing, but just write, God, reveal yourself to me. And for those of you who are kind of like, man, I've seen too much. You're speaking right to me. I don't know how you do it. I like did someone tell you about that me before I came here. I don't know if that's you, but listen, maybe today is the day that you need to give your life to Christ to, to kind of come clean and be like, I'm, I got nothing. Maybe you're at the fetal position now and you somehow made it to this rec center and you somehow are around other people who are the church who come from near and far, who are here to love you, serve you, to share God's word with you, to pray with you. Some of you might be sick, hurting, marriage diseased, teenager diseased. Darkness has kind of befallen you and you may need God to show up in a big way. Remember, you can pray for parking lot spots. That's okay. But Lord, I need rock star parking again today. I'm running late. Hey, God, remember, he's, he's a dad. So he cares about the inconsequential stuff. If my son wanted a parking spot and I had the power to give it to him, I'd do it. Sometimes I want to teach him patience, though. So this morning, um, if you don't know Jesus, this might be your first prayer. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I confess that I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you in my words, thoughts, actions. I believe your son Jesus came from heaven to earth and died on the cross for my sins. And he rose from the dead. Holy Spirit, come into my heart and make me the person you want me to be. God, I, I'm praying that somebody prayed that. I'm praying that through the darkness, you shot an arrow into their heart. You exploded it. You turned a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And for the first time, they're feeling again of what's been numbed. And God, I pray that they would respond to that and not try to cover it over stuff that's been uncovered. Father, would you do that thing that you do when you reveal yourself to people this morning? That we would be a people who pray. That we, in the same way, we're going to make a priority uh, to work out that we'd make a priority to pray. And same priority, we're gonna make a priority to go to work. We would make a priority to pray because our battle, God, is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of darkness in this present world. And we go to battle against those. Lord, would you help us to step up to fight and fight hard so that our love for people would be seen because of the way the humility has just drenched our hearts. God, I'm praying that for people that haven't prayed in a long time, maybe they've just had an issue with you for a while and they're like, I don't know, God. Would you please, would you please invigorate their heart again. Give them a renewed fire and spirit afresh to fall fresh on them because we need you, God. We need you. Every hour we need you. Lord, as uh, Grayson plays, would you just put on the hearts of the people here just to sit down and reflect and write out their prayer request. And just think about how badly they need you. And think about how desperately um, their needs will be met by a God who loves them. We love you, Jesus. We glorify you. Amen.